Hi, I'm Lynn Davis, Program Manager for Healthy Democracy. Welcome to our series, Discussions on Democracy. Today, we're going to take a step back and think broadly about the power of lottery-selected processes to bring people together across our many divides. To help do that, we have two guests. One's a Republican, one's a Democrat. One was born in Illinois, the other was, well, also born in Illinois. In fact, they actually have quite a bit in common because none of us are as divided as we appear. In this case, our two guests are, or were, elected officials in Western Oregon, representing places on the edge of major metro areas. And importantly for us, they're also both fervent supporters of improving our democratic processes and bringing everyday people into our most important decision making. Let me introduce them. Julie Fahey has represented Junction City and Western Eugene in the Oregon House of Representatives since 2017. Lou Ogden served as mayor of Tualatin, Oregon for 24 years before retiring about a year ago. Mayor Ogden, Representative Fahey, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having us, Lynn. Absolutely, pleasure's mine. Lou, I wanna start with you. Uh, let's talk about how we do public engagement in Oregon and in particular at the local government level. What do we do well? What do we do not quite so well? Well, fortunately, at the local level, we are obviously very close to our communities. And so folks don't have to travel far. Folks don't have to worry so much about the overload of, of, um, of people involved at, say, the county or the state level. So we have a, a proximity and an access to folks. So that's good. We also have a great intent on wanting to reach out to people. Uh, and I know that is true at all levels of government. Um, so what we do well is we have communication links through our newsletters, through our emails, through our texting, through our Facebook, you know, all the different mechanisms to connect to people. Uh, and then we do that also in our local city council meetings almost every week. We are asking folks to participate in one way or another. So there's that, I guess what we do well is that closeness and also that uh, intentionality of money to make sure that we're reaching out to people. Now, there are a lot of challenges to actually making that happen, and that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today in reality. I mean, an interesting sort of relevant and timely uh, thing to talk about in this topic is how we've done that during the time of COVID. Mm -hmm. So we've just released our plan for the 2021 legislative session about how to have public involvement in a, in a time when in-person interactions can be quite risky. And so I'm actually very excited about it. Um, we have had three special sessions this past year um, during COVID and we've taken testimony remotely. So by video, by phone, um, you know, written testimony, and then we've had a kiosk set up at, outside the Capitol for people to participate. And honestly, that has been, that has opened up so many doors in terms of having other people be able to participate in the legislative process. Because in, up until now, you know, in order to testify on a bill or, um, you know, meet in person face to face with your, your legislator, you had to come to the Capitol to do that. And so that made it very difficult for people in Eastern Oregon or in Southern Oregon that live quite far from Salem um, and for working people to come to the Capitol and give their input. So you'd have to take a day off work, arrange for childcare, all of those things. So I, you know, I actually was quite happy with um, even this last special session we had, we had a woman testify on a bill. She took a five minute break from her restaurant job and went into a closet and called on the phone to, to talk to us. And we never would have gotten her input in a regular session. So I, I'm very excited about kind of, I, I hope that this stays post -pand pandemic um, in terms of the input into the legislature. Um, and, and I think that goes for the constituent outreach work that legislators are doing as well. I have been to, you know, I've had lots of virtual town halls that um, people have been able to attend that they might not be able to have been able to come to in person. Um, and neighborhood meetings, you know, our neighborhood association meetings, we're getting great turnout for those meetings because um, people can just tune in and listen and multitask and fold the laundry while they attend. Um, they don't have to necessarily block off two hours of their time and figure out what they're going to do with their kids and dinner and all of that. Mayor Ogden, uh, 
Representative Fahey just talked about sort of the types of people who come to and, and involve themselves in public engagement, and that maybe there's sort of a silver lining in some ways to this more digital space that we're able to bring more people into the conversation. What was your experience pre-COVID? You didn't have the, the privilege of, of serving during this uh, period, but uh, of, of uh, what kinds of folks would, would show up and, and offer testimony in, in processes at the city level? First of all, uh, Representative Fahey is ac ac actually right and spot on in that not just in local government, but in so much of what we do in commerce and everything else, one of the silver linings, if you want to call it that, to this virus has been, um, we have been forced to advance the technology to allow us to have these access. So that's great. And, you know, prior to that, I, I left office two years ago. So we were uh, experimenting with, you know, even like call-in or other sorts of remote access. Um, obviously, this pandemic has forced us all to make that a matter of practice rather than a matter of experimentation. Um, and so it does allow more people to participate um, from a proximity, from an access standpoint. The question I think still relates or comes down to that the, um, the interest of people to want to do that and um, how, many, how many people are aware, cognizant and motivated to take the time, frankly, even to dial in on a Zoom call um, or um, go to a website or whatever. So, and I think that's really, we'll probably drill down more deeply on this in the conversation because that's really the, the, the true value in my mind of uh, the, the deliberative democracy process. And I would just jump in to add, you know, I, I completely agree with that, that, um, you know, especially at the local level, one of the things that I see is that the, the people who show up to city council meetings or planning commission meetings aren't necessarily representative of, or my town halls for that matter you know, aren't necessarily representative of the broader population because, you know, it, I represent a, a lower income district. And so I'm, I often say that people don't have time to come to a town hall or to show up to testify at that city council hearing in favor of affordable housing because they have two jobs and kids and need to get dinner on the table. And so I, um, you know, that's, that's clearly an issue with our systems and processes in terms of how we solicit public input. For me personally, one of the ways that I try to get around that is, um, for example, when I ran for office in 2016, I knocked on almost 7,000 doors to talk to voters one-on-one. -on -one. And that, that was so valuable to me in terms of getting a broader, more representative sample of people's opinions. I, even if I could just get someone for two minutes at their door, you know, what, is, what are the issues that are most important to you? What do you want me to work on in Salem? Um, getting, that, uh, getting that view was so important to sort of have a, a broader sense of what people are thinking, what their concerns are, and, and what issues they want us as elected officials to work on. Um, and so I, obviously that's very difficult to do now during COVID, but um, even when we were in session, in my first session, in my second session, long session, I would go door to door on weekends sometimes just to check in with folks and see, get a sense of, um, you know, what they thought about what we were working on. Did they know about what they, we were working on in the legislature? Um, and really to provide that one-on-one -on -one connection between people and their government. So, you know, that, that really is important in connecting with people emotionally. So we've just talked about the benefits of technology and how we open up more access and more portals. And that's great. Uh, but, you know, that notion of uh, knocking on someone's door, there are folks who don't want you knocking on their door. I've been there, right? But I can tell you that I had people come up to me like 20 years later and say, you know, you knocked on my door 20 years ago. And I, I was impressed by that. And what my purpose was not to impress them, but to let them know, as Julie just mentioned, that we care about what they really think. So if someone has been solicited, if you will, at the front door by a candidate and shows that they really care what people think, that sticks with them. And I think that makes them more amenable to checking in at a city council meeting or testifying on a bill or whatever, because Representative Fahey knocked on my door. She really does want to know what I think. So maybe I will uh, uh, tap into this bill hearing. Um, and so I think we can replicate that, certainly not in numbers, but you replicate that impact with the deliberative democracy approach, the lottery approach, where we're gaining people's attention and then getting them sort of immersed in the issue because it, A, it takes desire on their part, B, it takes interest, and C, it takes 
being ramped up on the facts enough to be able to um, really formulate a, a concern or a position in a way that can be rep, uh, responded to. I mean, I can, you know, I can read the newspaper or listen to the radio and, or the television or online or whatever and hear something about an event and formulate an opinion. But if I haven't really researched it much, my opinion may be valid to me at the time, but it may not be accurate. I'll just add, um, I had that same experience of people who write to me today and saying, you know, you knocked on my door four or five years ago. Um, and so because I did that and established that connection, they knew, okay, I can contact, I can email, I can call your office um, and you care what I think, or you can help me solve a problem with government. Um, just about every day I went out doing the canvassing door to door, I had someone say, you're the first person that has ever come to my door and asked me what I thought about things. And that, that was so um, rewarding for me as an individual. And also just, uh, that's how we rebuild some of the mistrust I think that has developed is those establishing those one-on-one -on -one connections. And as Lou said, it's hard to do that at scale, but I am responsible for you know, my district, my, my constituents, and I have the control over um, that level of communication and how we how I establish those relationships and that trust between myself and my constituents. I think that's a really interesting point. And people certainly say that to us whenever they respond to one of these mailings is, well, this is the first time anybody's asked. There's also another challenge, which is our sort of uh, very extreme political polarization at the moment. In terms of polarization and what we can do to kind of break things down and rebuild trust, um, I, I really can only talk about what I have seen that has worked um, personally for me in my role as a state legislator. I think there is so much that we don't control in state and local government in terms of partisan polarization and the messages coming out of DC and our president right now um, that again, I try to focus on what are the things that are within my control. So in terms of interesting things that I have seen um, in terms of polarization and how do we engage folks. One thing that I'll just say is that, you know, I, I read all my email and my office responds to all of the email and we, clearly get, you know, and phone calls, of course, um, we clearly get people who contact us and who are upset about issues or who, um, you know, are taking some of the federal narratives and applying them to what's happening in our state. And I have a, I have a policy. I read all the emails. We respond within a week. Um, and we don't, you know, we take people's comments seriously. So there have been times when people have written me very angrily and you know, potentially using disparaging language, and we still respond from an issues-oriented policy perspective. We take their question seriously. We respond to the substance of the question. We ignore the disparaging comments. And not every time, but sometimes people respond back and just shocked that I took that question seriously and thank you for your thoughtful response to it. And sometimes I change people's minds. Um, you know, even people who are big critics of mine who email me a lot with criticism. Um, I had someone, uh, one of those folks emailed me after the last election and said, you know, you're the first Democrat I've ever voted for because you engage with me in that way. And so similarly to the, to the going door to door and, and knocking on people's door and asking them what they think, lots of people told me that I was the first Democrat I ever, they ever voted for because I took them seriously enough to do that. So, um, all I can control is those one-on-one -on -one interactions and making sure that people can build that relationship with me, have some level of foundation and trust in their government um, and, and do that work. I mean, it really, what it takes is the work of um, elected officials to, to build those relationships. Mayor Ogden, we talked uh, some time ago about uh, how at the local level, even though as a mayor, you were in an officially nonpartisan uh, role, political role that you had found over time that things were feeling more partisan? First of all, I guess I, to go back to the point, as in my position, it was, it is a nonpartisan position as most, uh, in fact, in Oregon, I think all uh, municipal uh, and most of the county positions are nonpartisan. So you start from a position of not being affiliated to an ideology. Now we all have innate uh, opinions, we all have um, ideologies we may ascribe to or subscribe to uh, without actually having that official partisan label on our office. But I will tell you, again, I was elected first in 1992. And in my uh, years as mayor, 
worked with a lot of city councilors on the Tualatin City Council, worked with a lot of other city councilors across the region, across the state, across the nation, uh, elected officials at all levels, counties, state, federal, um, metro. And in the first 15 years even, um, I couldn't tell you what registration most of those people had, those elected officials. It just, you know, it wasn't germane, it didn't come up. Um, you know, there's that old saying, there's no Republican or Democrat way to fill a pothole. Um, but I will tell you in the, la in the, the, the last five years, um, it came up a lot. It came up a lot by the elected officials. Folks would, would lead with that information um, or they would, um, and, and maybe me, I mean, I say they, we um, maybe would uh, coattail on something that was happening at the state or the national level, as, as Julie mentioned, and sort of bring that in either through innuendo or unintentionally or maybe directly. So um, that's not good. That's just, that's just not good. Um, I think we are, we have become products of that, A, by the media, B, by um, just what's happened in politics. Um, you know, Julie mentioned the current president. I can uh, cite examples of from both parties for a number of years uh, where that has begun to grow. So that bleeds off into the public. Um, I think the other piece of it is that by construct, the legislature is partisan. By construct, Congress is partisan. And so members, though um, everyone has does their due diligence, does their investigation, does their connection with the public, as, as Julie has mentioned, um, it's not often you see much split from in votes um, on contentious issues from the partisan position, the party line, if you will. So it, it does bring into question, well, okay, um, I can name names. Peter DeFazio is known to be sort of his own man. I, I respect Peter a lot. Um, but, you know, when it comes down to it, he largely votes with his caucus. And you can say the same thing at the state level and so on. At the local level, you don't get that. Um, you don't get that backdrop. You don't get that safe harbor. You don't get that excuse. You got to pony up for each individual issue. Uh, and so, you know, um, we need to get back to getting local politics into the local issues and not so much um, delving into the partisan mantra uh, and the ideology that exists, well-meaning or not. I don't mean to disparage that in many cases. Um, it's, it is well-meaning, but it still exists as sort of a uh, birds of a feather mentality or at least the appearance thereof. Yeah, that's sort of our interest in doing in working specifically with local governments. And sort of, we had originally worked at a at a little bit larger level at the state level, and and but sort of seeing the the polarization and the disenchantment with the political process across the political spectrum at the moment, it's arguably one of the only things we have sort of ideologically in common anymore. Uh, uh, that we feel like we can work still though at the local level where issues are not put into buckets still and where people still care about no matter what else is happening the vacant lot down the street and what their commute to work is like and that kind of stuff and and sort of rebuild remake democracy at that level or make a new uh, uh, democratic engagement at that level. And let me segue that straight into our potential solutions. And what you see is sort of the brightest spots in, in public engagement. And then, and specifically how this kind of process that we're in the middle of in Eugene, that uh, you, Representative Fahey, actually were a, uh, an expert called to testify. Uh, and, and um, Mayor Ogden, you've seen these before, that uh, how this this is one among many other potential solutions. Yeah, I, I was thrilled to participate in the process um, going on in Eugene right now for the implementation of uh, what a bill we passed called House Bill 2001 around um, zoning and the use of middle housing. Um, I, I, and I'll just talk a little bit about why I was so excited to see this process. So at the local level, my experience, so I'm the chair of the House Housing Committee. So I do a lot of work in the issue of housing and addressing our housing crisis here in Oregon. And one of the things that I see at the local level is that when there are local decisions made, 
you know, very technical things around parking or requirements or, you know, zoning or um, setback requirements for ADUs or anything like that. Um, the people or a new development, for example, on a corner, um, the folks that show up to testify at city council meetings or planning commission meetings are the people who have the time and the resources and the wherewithal to know how to engage with their government. And they tend to be people who are homeowners, um, potentially already securely housed. And so the challenge with that is you're not hearing from the folks who are renters or the folks who just need an affordable place to, to live. Um, and I tend to represent, as I mentioned before, in a, a lower income part of Lane County. And my folks don't have time to go and say, yes, I support this new development because we need more housing because the cost of housing is too high. And so the, the particularly when you're talking about a new housing development or a new, you know, any kind of zoning or, or housing decision, um, the benefits of that decision are diffuse. You're creating more housing, which basic law of supply and demand is going to, you know, put downward pressure on pricing, but the costs of a housing decision are very localized. So you might get the neighbors um, objecting to that because they don't want additional cars parking on the street or um, additional density. And so that, that um, challenge around who are elected leaders and planning commission members hearing from as it relates to housing, I really have been for years sort of thinking on this idea of how do you get a more representative sample of the community and what the community really needs. So this, this process for 2001 of sending out, you know, letters to a representative sample of uh, residents of Eugene and getting a more broad, broad input on issues of housing, that was so exciting to me. And even just in participating um, in that session that I participated in, people asked great questions, like, you know, just everything about it, you're paying them to participate, you're paying them to sort of say, to have the time to, to learn about these issues, to become technical experts on the topic, to ask the questions that they need to ask, and then to make the decisions from their perspective as a, a renter or as someone who lives in particular neighborhoods or comes from particular racial groups. Um, I loved it. I loved everything about it. Um, and so I really appreciate the work that you all are doing to try and make sure that the voices that are heard in government are more representative of, of the people. I would add to that that um, you mentioned housing as an example. It's a great example because it is visceral to a lot of people. But whatever the issue is, at least at the local level, we strive and we ponder as elected officials and we lament the ability, the, the fact that we don't have the ability to really get a broad cross section of what does, what do most people in the community think about that issue, whatever the issue is. And I've always felt like if I could just reach over the fence and chat with the neighbor who's, you know, doing their gardening or trimming their roses or picking up the toys from their, their, their toddler and say, by the way, tell me how you feel about this and such. If I could just do that with enough, um, with enough neighbors, you know, Julie mentions going door to door, but just, you know, after work, on, a, on an afternoon across the, the neighborhood fence, I can get a better sense of what does the average person think and feel and respond to that. Um, and so to her point, we don't get typically the average person doing that for whatever reason. And the other component that is so valuable, I think about this lottery process and engaging people head and long into it is that uh, Julie, I think made a great comment that maybe homeowners have a different perspective, you know, I hate, to, I hate to categorically, but maybe homeowners as a propensity have a greater, uh, or I mean, as a statistical norm, have a greater propensity for one feeling versus folks who are not homeowners or long established folks in the neighborhood versus newcomers in the neighborhood. But I think when you put those folks together in the same room, and when you then bring out all the facts and let them De develop those facts in their minds and then share with each other, perhaps there's an awakening or at least a, a, an awareness of that other perspective. That really does make sense, number one. Number two, um, maybe, I'll just pick on homeowners for a moment, maybe homeowners generally have greater concerns about density and parking and so on, but maybe it's only those who really viscerally feel that way, they're gonna come out and testify 
And maybe a whole lot of the homeowners are thinking, you know, if more of my neighbors can afford housing and we get more diversity in the neighborhood, I'm willing to put up a few more cars. But we don't hear from those folks. So again, that's what that lottery process brings out, bringing a better cross-section and then bringing sort of an exchange of ideas amongst that cross-section to formulate positions that may be broader than they were initially coming in through the process. That's, I absolutely agree with that. Um, and I wanna say that there's absolutely nothing wrong from with elected officials hearing from homeowners or higher income folks or you know people from certain neighborhoods that they, those folks should have a voice in government too. The challenge comes in when, uh, you know, Lou referenced the, the average resident. You know, if elected officials start to feel like the average resident is those people because they're not hearing from everyone, then you know that then the the voice of the homeowner or the the res of the certain neighborhoods or income levels starts to sort of have more weight in government. And and what I care about is everyone having equal weight with their voice in government. Um, and so I think that this you know the the lottery based process is helpful in doing that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, on those very appreciated words of encouragement from both of you, thank you, Representative Fahey and Mayor Ogden, for spending some time with me here today. Well, thank you for the invitation. Thanks for the encouragement and keep up the good work. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for having us today. Mm -hmm.